And I always thought, I wondered when you did the opera on the Central Park Five, why you chose opera as a form of narrative and storytelling for the Central Park Five. And as you talked about the complexity of the Black, the black experience, the African-American experience, in all its textures and expressions, opera seemed rather fitting. Is that yeah, how you came to opera? Opera, work, opera because you actually tell the story with music. The, oh. mu the music is embedded into the narrative. You know, so it drives the narrative. So the music, you, music always has to be part of the action. And what I, what I don't like about most musicals, you know, there are certainly exceptions, is that the music doesn't necessarily drive the narrative. Music is more, more the, in, the, in the position of static, of the static, of stasis, in which there, there's a, the, you know, the, the characters stop and the action stops and the, and the, the interaction of the characters kind of comes to a stop and then it, either you hear the music and then, you know, you go back into the dialogue. So that tension always bothered me. I, I like the idea. I was much more comfortable with having through, through composed music in which music embraces the whole story and also takes you emotionally from one place to another. So is the music speaking to an emotion that doesn't have words, that lives beyond words? Is the, is the music, would it be the pain of the characters or the story? Is it the, the, the textured landscape of the complexity of the emotions they're feeling that they just can't give a language to? Is that what some of the music does in the opera? Well, music, to me, music is, does everything. It takes, it establishes time and place and atmosphere. It creates tension. I, and I think that for me, you know, tension, the tension in terms of uh, producing, ma making that uh, the scenes come alive in, in that sense. It's really important to em embrace in the music. Uh, and also um, then in ter terms of the character, you're revealing the character, it reveals their vulnerabilities, etc. So one thing about uh, opera that's f so funny is that characters get to voice their inner selves. And when an actor, like in a movie or a play, would never dream, would never think about, you know, saying what, telling the audience what they feel. I mean, because, <laughs> because they're supposed to, indi that's indicate, so they, they, they do that with their acting. They have a, sometimes they, they use what they, you know, a, a subtext, a subtext of the internal life of the character that they bring to the performance. So you have the, the feeling of the past and all that, but in opera, you actually, a lot of aries actually tell that where the emotion feeling comes from, where it comes from. So you can talk a little bit about that. You know, the, sub the subtext is really brought to the fore and, the, and particularly the psychological subtext, why, you know, uh, how, what puts a character in a, in, the, in a certain position. So the audience is then taking this emotional voyage, at least invited to take an yeah. emotional voyage with the character in real time. Yes, and also the fact yeah, yeah, that they also identify with the five. That was very important in the opera, that I felt that the audience, whether black, white, Asian, anybody, realized that they, are the, they could be the five or their, their children could be the five and, and really identify with them and understand that, you know, that what they go through is what you go through. You know, so, so, that, they, so that that immediacy, that feeling of what, 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 uh, trying to un and as I wrote the music, I tried to understand what it must have felt like to be in that position, and how how, do you how, how horrific and terrifying it was, and uh, and the fact that how they how they would felt there was the need to uh, confess to a crime they did not commit, you know. So so there's that the idea of how the the DA and the and the mask figure in the opera could try to to coerce them into confessing is in a way about about how how they, they, in a way, they, how they tear them apart as individuals, you know. It's interesting because when we talk about that, I mean, these were boys, um, one Latino exactly. and four African-American between the ages of 14 and 16. These were children. Yes, children, that's definitely. And one of them, because he was 16, was actually tried as an adult. So he ended up in an adult prison for 13 years. And ended up school. meeting and ended up meeting the actual the person who actually committed the, the crime while he was yes, in prison. He That's right. Yes, right. yes, he met him in prison in Rikers. I said in Rikers actually uh, early on, and actually they got in a fight in prison. 
which is which was uh, over the over the television, I think. <laughs> what was that television? <laughs> but but then later, Matthias Reyes uh, became a born again Christian, and he wanted to confess for all his crimes, and so he confessed that he actually had had raped uh, raped uh, the the Central Park Joker Miele, Miss Miele, and so. Uh, and, and it, through his confession, they and, and they also then they found DNA evidence linking him to the crime. Interesting. Talk and a no bit, DNA evidence with the five. Talk a little bit about how the project came to you and what attracted you to the project. Um, how did the project find you, or did you find it? And what was the journey in creating this this story? Well, it found me actually because um, uh, Kevin Maynard, who runs his this opera an opera singer who runs the trilogy opera company uh sent me a libretto he said well could you read this libretto and, and recommend someone to to write music for this libretto and it was a libretto by richard wesley based on the central park five so i read the libretto and i called him back and i said i'd like to do it because i was i, was, I thought the subject was was really rich um the first draft of the libretto did not have donald trump in it so that's right no, so I, so I said, well, you have to have Trump in the opera. I mean, you can't do this. With him. And, and, and I guess he thought that the mask could kind of represent Trump and all the other kind of ne negative uh, figures who, who kind of perpetuate racism, et cetera, in the, in the opera. But, but, I, but I thought it was important to have Trump in the opera and also a female DA who was also not in the original libretto because and then uh that so so we were able to uh with the revisions create those two character add those two crack characters to the opera and that really helped in terms of you know seeing what how the opera would develop and i believe if i remember correctly you started the opera i think serendipitously three days after trump either announced he was going to run for president or was inaugurated which one is it uh well well actually the performance of it we did a performance in newark uh, kind of workshop production of the opera that was done the Friday after the election, 2016, the Friday after the election. So, so we he were in was rehearsal during the time of the, of, uh, on the election day, I was in rehearsal with that <laughs> opera. And uh, yeah, so Trump's rise happened, I mean, I think I started the opera in 2000. 15 beginning of 2015 i started working on it so you could see trump's rise through the whole it was happening during that the whole time i was working on the opera i realized that i'm uh, making the assumption that the audience know the story of the central park five can you give us a brief summary of what the story is so the audience can catch up with us a bit for those of them yes. who may yes. not know who the story is. A woman trisha miele was was assaulted and raped in central park a, called the she was called the central park jogger at one point and uh the number of of uh, african-american and hispanic youths were had descended into the park uh, uh actually they just have a good time sometimes to do you know like up in trash cans and do kind of mischievous things in the park uh <laughs> so so the the police were eager to round up yeah, you know, some young men to that they were going to charge to to hold and charge with with the with the crime. And they initially, they ha they held a, n a number of young men. I mean, initially, I think they had six for a while, and then they allowed one to go. So eventually, they settled on the five, and uh, the five were all accused of of the of the assault charge and et cetera. And they were also tried tried in the press. The press was had. It was very inflammatory in terms of racial tensions and racial relations in New York. Um, and Donald Trump actually put a full page ad in, in the Post and the Daily News calling for the return of the death penalty. And he said, support our police, return the death, bring back the, the death penalty. That was the slogan. So uh, Trump, Trump he seized upon this, this event to advance his political career, I think. I think the beginning of his political career was with the Central Park Five. By vilifying the, the Central Park Five and demonizing them, he was able to, to uh, take advantage of the, of the racial tensions in New York and galvanize some of the you know, extreme white groups within New York uh, behind him. 
And it was, and the irony was this all happened in 1989. And 1989 is significant because it also represented the emergence of hip hop into the mainstream culture. So, so when there was, for example, when they, the whole expression they was in the post in the Daily News, they said, wilding in the park. They, these wilding. Teenagers, wilding. Now, wilding came from a Tone Loke song called Wild Thing. So they were actually singing Wild Thing. They remember were singing that. Wild Thing when they went into the park, the kids. Yeah. So, so it wasn't wilding, it's Wild Thing. Wow. So, so, um, so, the, but wilding became this phenomenon they were ta they talked about, you know, and uh, but it was also symbolic of the, of of the fear in the particularly in the white population in New York of hip hop culture. The hip hop culture was sort of this idea, this fostering rebellion and and violence, and it was a threat to particularly a threat to the the uh, real estate ambitions of Donald Trump, who was looking to when you look at the development of the Upper West Side, or the West Side in Manhattan, you know, all the, all the apartment buildings along, along the river, et cetera, how important Central Park is in that. You know, it's like the link between the West Side and Harlem. And so, uh, whoops, yeah, yeah, there's this, there's it is. Bring back, the, bring back our police. And you see the other sign saying, do the right thing. Right. That's very interesting. Okay, because Spike Lee's movie came out in 1989. So actually, my theory is that when they put these five young men in prison, they were putting Radio Rahim in prison. Can, can you tell so, everyone what Radio Rahim is? Radio Rahim is the character with the boombox. Yes. Who goes do into the thing. Parlor, and he's playing his music very loudly. And Danny Aiello, who plays the, the owner of the pizza joint, gets really upset and doesn't want to hear that music. And he doesn't have any black figures on his like white famous people like Joe DiMaggio and Sinatra and people like that on the wall, but there are no black people, pictures of black people on the wall. So he points this out and then he, he turns up the music and then Danny Aiello takes a baseball bat and smashes the boom box. So that scene to me and crystallizes a lot of what, what I think was going on is that the, 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 resent, the fear and, and antipathy toward this new new music and new culture, hip hop, which is also was per, starting to permeate white culture too, That's right. and white middle America, and so so that so so in a way this violent this act of of finally you know putting these these five young men in prison was a way to uh, to re rectify and to to uh, uh, submerge the 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 emergence of hip hop. You know, it's interesting that um, when you think of opera <clears throat> and you think of the, the, the five boys of Central Park, the Central Park Five, and you know, the folks who go to opera don't know anything about the lives of the Central, the Central Park Five. And generally speaking, the boys of Central Park Five know nothing about opera. So essentially you've converged two worlds to come into a theater to sit and watch the experience side by side with each other. What was that like and what were you hoping they collectively would walk away from the theater with. with. What, what behavior or information did you want those two worlds to converge and to walk away with? That's a very interesting question. I think that one, one of the things was in the audience at Long Beach was uh, there are many people who came to the opera because of the Central Park Five, the subject matter, who had never seen an opera, including people. I had a number of young men who were, had been incarcerated and falsely accused of a crime who were in jail and they, and they came to the opera and they, for them it was a very emotional experience. Uh, and then you know I had, I had I, so I, I think the mixture of the opera audience looking at a, a subject matter that they wouldn't usually see in an opera and then the, the a large audience that would never go to an opera who seeing an opera for the first time. And I think that that's, 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 that's wonderful to me because in a way they're both having novel experiences. They were having, you know, this, an experience they hadn't had before taken out of, you know, the opera crowd being confronted with, with uh, issues and, and, 
asked to empathize with with someone that they may not may not normally feel it, you know normally empathize with, and then the audience of uh, of the of the people who came for the story re realizing the you know hearing music that they may not have heard before, but also an extent the music also what also drew upon you know the the African American tradition in different ways. So they they heard for example I did a when they were going into the park. I wrote a parody of uh, a P-Funk song, which was uh, <laughs> Bring in the Funk. Who's got the funk? Yeah, you know. Uh, that, who's so, cause the funk? Is, that way, is that Parliament? Huh? Is that Parliament? Yeah, funk, uh, yeah Parliament Funkadelic, yeah, George sure. Clinton. So I thought, I thought of using that because how hip hop always borrows. I mean, they're sampling music all the time. So they sample, you know, particularly R&B from the 70s is, is ripe for it. They, they do that all the time. So, so, and so I, I brought, so I bringing that in that, you know, that suggestion of that song, but I, but I, rather than sampling, I used, I write parody. <laughs> so, 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 so there's, so the idea is that, that, so uh, going into the park was that, that in a way that excitement, youthful excitement, and naive, youthful and naive, excitement. And the innocence, in, the innocence of realizing youth. Realizing their sexuality, who they are, you know, trying to, get, you know, get in, go in the park and, you know, there's kind of exuberance that, that's crushed. That be, that's crushed when, when this awful thing happened and then also with the police response. So that's, I, I think that's, that's, uh, that was very interesting to me. And that's an innocence that never can be recovered. That's an incident. That's an innocence that no, can never it's, it's retrieve. Not, and they always talk. To, all the five talk about the loss of innocence. Yeah. That, that they lost their lost their childhood, lost their youth, and and uh, Shron, I have an aria was Shron Salam talks about that, uh, and then also Corey's aria at the at the end of uh, in, in Act Three and uh, actually addresses that too.